yes. That's right. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Alparins. Help. Alparins. That will be salute. Oh yeah. Seventy. Center, okay. <laughs> oh, you yeah, haven't that, that was a long time ago. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, you're Stanford now. Right? I'm a Stanford young man. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Better weather. <laughs> Sorry? Better weather not up north. <laughs> very, very nice places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've been back in South Africa a few times. Yeah. <laughs> I think they've forgiven me now. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm working a lot. I mean, I'm Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, ICTS Championship, Tsunami Championship lecture by uh, Professor Sudhir Sashmi. Uh, so you must be knowing that ICTS, that is the International Center of the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research is a new initiative in Indian science which uh, has been conceived for being a catalysis for research in India and also for uh, the uh, development of uh, human resources and students and uh, outreach of science with the Civil society. Uh, the uh, permanent campus of the ICTS is uh, going to be not very far from here in North Bangalore and uh, will be ready by the uh, middle of 2013. Till then, we are guests of uh, various institutions, including the Ministry of Science in Bangalore, where these programs are ready. Uh, we all know that uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar was one of the most eminent physicists, master physicists of uh, uh, from our country. And in his honor, we decided to have a, a lecture series. Now, this lecture series is very uh, is basically modeled after the lower lectures of Harvard University, in which uh, uh, it's a very interesting format. In which the first lecture is. Uh, meant for a more general audience, uh, which uh, <coughs> introduces the subject. Uh, and the next two lectures are more technical nature. And uh, what we have done, actually, beyond uh, <coughs> the usual uh, format of these type of lectures, is that we have decided always to organize a small workshop of uh, interested researchers in the area of the membership. So this is why adjoining this Tanishetha uh, lecture is a meeting on uh, strongly correlated systems in condensed matter and uh, string theory. So uh, having said that, uh, I'd uh, very much now like to uh, request uh, Professor Roger Blanford. Roger Blanford is a member of the International Advisory Council of uh, ICTS. He is in Bangalore uh, for another Chandrasekhar Symposium organized by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And uh, coincidentally, and very fortunately for us, he is also here today. So I request uh, Professor Lanford to present a bouquet and a certificate to Professor Sri Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, lecture certificate too. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your lecture. Well. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Keda and Spenta. It's a real honor for me, I guess I shouldn't use that, uh, to be here, uh, especially on this occasion of the uh, centenary of uh, Professor uh, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar's birth, uh, and also at the occasion of the, uh, uh, of the forming of this uh, exciting institute, uh, International Center for Theoretical Sciences. Okay, uh, so I'm going to, uh, as uh, Spenta has hinted, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some recent research by, uh, by a number of people, uh, many of whom are at this meeting. And this research is at the interface of two very different fields uh, of physics. One is, uh, as Spenta mentioned, condensed matter physics, which is the study of materials like superconductors and metals and insulators, which I will define uh, shortly. Uh, and that's been the main focus of my research uh, over many years. Uh, but in, in the last few years, there's been a surprising and very exciting connection uh, of this thinking about phases of matter, uh, this field which thinks about phases of matter, to, to work coming from studies of black holes and string theory, uh, which was, of course, a subject closer to the heart of uh, Professor Subraman and Chandrasekhar. So my aim today is to, to kind of give you a flavor of the intersection of these two fields and, and what are the fundamental deep questions in, uh, in physics that uh, we're trying to answer uh, both theoretically and experimentally. So, uh, so let me begin uh, at a very basic level. So when I say phases of matter, I'm sure many of you immediately say, I know what that means. Uh, phases of matter are just, there's just three of them. There's solids, liquids, and gases, and that's of course the elementary uh, understanding of what different phases of matter are. So although this is a very simple classification, uh, understanding you know, what the differences are between uh, these phases of matter it took several thousand years of human history before only, only in, the, uh, in the early 20th century that we started to understand the distinction uh, between these phases of matter. Uh, and th there's a very simple theory that implicitly I think all of you know, but let me just quickly list it. First of all, crucial to this understanding of the distinction between the phases is that matter is made of atoms. 
uh, an idea that sometimes is uh, according to the Greeks, but in India we know there was also discussion earlier but, uh, on, on, on the atomic theory of matter. Uh, so that's number one. Then we need to know about how atoms move around. And the basic uh, principle there is Newton's laws, that the atoms move because of forces between them. Uh, and these are the same forces that act on Apple or the moon. Uh, and once you put that together and understand how collections of atoms behave, uh, and that really took the early part of the 20th century to understand well, starting with the word of Boltzmann, we come up with an understanding of what forms these phases of matter. And the distinction is really in, in the way the atoms are arranged in these three states. So in, in a solid, uh, the atoms are arranged in a very regular arrangement, like in ice. Uh, in water, the atoms are moving around in a random uh, configuration, but rather dense. And finally, in a, in a gas, like steam, uh, the atoms are again random, but much less, uh, much less dense. So that's our conclusion, then, of the theory of the phases of matter. But I want to now look at a finer distinction between different phases. So let's take three solids, and here I've listed copper, silicon, and YBCO. Uh, so this is a material I'll say much more about. It's a superconductor with a very complicated crystal structure. Uh, but looking at just the, uh, this very simple classical theory of the phases of matter, these look essentially identical. They all have regular arrangements or atoms. So where the distinction between them appears, if you, if you ask how, uh, how these uh, different materials conduct electricity. So if I take a copper wire and put it put a bulb with a battery, then this copper wire conducts electricity and the, and, and the bulb will light up. If I took silicon, the bulb won't light up and it's an insulator. But finally, if I take YBCO, this material I'll say much more about, uh, the bulb does light up, but not very brightly. But if I cool the wire, then it conducts electricity so well, it's a superconductor, it conducts electricity without resistance, and the bulb lights very brightly. Even more remarkably, you could take miles of copper, uh, uh, miles of YBCO wire, and you still get a very bright uh, light because there's essentially no dissipation of electricity in this superconductor. So why do you see a superconductor? And we'd like to understand the distinction between a superconductor, an insulator, and a metal. And clearly, our, our, my discussion so far of the phases of matter is not far enough for that. I have to not worry about just the motion of the atoms, classically, but I have to think about the electrons and how they move uh, in, in this lattice of atoms. So, so here's a, now this YBCO is uh, recently put to good use. Here's a, a picture of nearly several kilometers of YBCO wire transmitting electricity. And the remarkable thing about a material like YBCO is that a little tape of YBCO here can transmit any, as much power as, as this big copper wire. And that's again associated with the fact that it's a superconductor which can transmit electricity uh, without any resistance. Uh, so very recently, this whole uh, YBCO wire has been put to good use. It's a plan for uh, putting superconducting wire underneath uh, sole up to, what does it say? Uh, I think about 20 kilometers of YBCO wire will go under the city of Seoul uh, to provide high density power in a very small region and very efficiently. The only catch is you have to take the wire and cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, but that's not so hard. Uh, it's not so expensive to pump liquid nitrogen through the, through the cables and get electricity uh, being transmitted between different regions of the city. So in fact, that's what these, these pipes here, these are pipes carrying liquid nitrogen, cooling the YBC wires so they can transmit a large amounts of power. So uh, I want to show you a little demonstration here uh, due to Nandini Trivedi from Ohio State University. I don't know how you can see this. Maybe you can get the lights off, possibly. OK. So right here, you see a little cake. That's a piece of YBCO. It's a little ceramic. And it's floating on a bed of magnets here. These are just ordinary magnets, near dim magnets. And that little cake has been cooled down. It's been dipped into liquid nitrogen. And it's floating right above uh, the magnets. And if I now set the movie moving, uh, you see the cake. Floating, you just give it a little push, it continues to move. Uh, eventually, it hits the, the magnets because at this point, its temperature became too high. It stopped being a superconductor, and uh, so it no longer floated above the magnets. So, the same property of the superconductor that allows it to 
conduct electricity very efficiently also makes it uh, very unfriendly to magnetic fields. So the, so the, so the YBCO wants to stay above uh, these, these magnets to, so that it doesn't experience any magnetic field, and that's really what makes it levitate. So these remarkable materials are, are superconductors, and as you can see, uh, they, they can be also of, of much practical use. So what I want to do in the remaining part of this talk is tell you something about the theory of the electrical phases of matter, not, not the atomic phases. Uh, and the theory now, uh, again, has three simple ingredients. So previously, all I had to know to know the difference between liquid gases and solids was that uh, was the existence of atoms. But now, in these solids, I need to know that the atoms have electrons around them, and the electrons separate from the atoms and move throughout the entire crystal. So that's theory one. Point two is that I can't apply Newton's laws to the electrons. So I could apply them to the atoms, and I come up with a very satisfactory theory of the difference between ice and water. But to understand the difference between silicon and a superconductor, I can't use Newton's laws anymore. What I have to use are, is the quantum theory of Heisenberg and Schrodinger, which was developed in the 1920s, apply it not just to one electron, but to the infinite number of electrons that are present in a big crystal like YBC or copper. So initially, you might think the quantum theory is of only interest uh, to some physicists working in a laboratory looking at single electrons. That's far from the truth. Just to understand why uh, material like copper conducts elasticity, or why you know why steel is so reflective, you really have to think about the quantum mechanics of the electrons and how they collectively interact with each other in, in these materials. Uh, so what, what's needed then to understand the theories of matter, and to think of the quantum phases of matter, while thinking about the motion of electrons in all these materials. Okay, so I want to introduce, and I'm not going to assume you know much about the quantum theory. And of course, it takes a whole year course to even begin to write down the basic equation of quantum mechanics. But I want to introduce here uh, 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 this the central concept. And the central concept we have, that will, I think, get you very far in understanding the distinction between these phases is a con uh, it's a very non-classical concept. There's no analog in Newton's equations. It's the concept of quantum superposition and a related concept, uh, which has become very fashionable these days uh, in use, but understood a while back, is the concept of quantum entanglement. So let me first introduce, and these ideas will eventually connect up to superconductivity. Uh, I also want to say a little bit about quantum criticality, because that's a subject that ties together superconductivity eventually with black holes and string theory. So these are, this is the practical material I want to understand. This is the theoretical work on black holes that Chandrasekhar did and its consequences. And these will all tie together with the central concepts of quantum superposition. So let me begin by just talking about quantum superposition, and then we'll introduce the, uh, the other areas. OK, so the basic defining experiment in quantum mechanics is the so-called double slit experiment. So the way to illustrate it is to think about first interference, what the phenomenon of interference of water waves. So we send a water wave here, and it goes through this uh, barrier, which has two slits in it. Now, as the wave goes through, each slit will radiate its own waves, and they'll start to interfere with each other, as shown here. As a consequence of interference, we'll see a, uh, and imagine the water has a certain, is carrying some dye, and that dye leaves a trace on the screen here. So you'll see a characteristic pattern on the screen, which is a consequence of the wave, the waves propagating and the fact that it went through a double slit. Now, what launched the discovery of quantum mechanics was an experiment like this, where you don't send in waves, but you send in, an, you have an electron gun here, just like an electron gun in a TV. So it's shooting out electrons, and you, shut, you send these electrons through, again, a double slit. And remarkably, what you see is exactly the kind of uh, uh, pattern that you saw with waves over here. Uh, you see these alternate bright and dark regions which are characteristic of wave passing through these double slits. If I, was just, if I send marbles through these double slits, then I just see a big bump near the first slit and a big bump near the second slit, and that's about it. But what you see then is this oscillating pattern, uh, which, is, which would suggest that the electrons are waves. OK, maybe electrons are waves, but it's really not as simple as that. Suppose I try to ask, and if I, I think of the electron as a particle, much like a marble, which I can count, 
it's not, not a water wave really, I can count electrons one at a time. So I ask the question, which slit does the electron go through? Well, then I can imagine doing an experiment where I look for the electron. And it turns out that when you look for the electrons and you, and you watch them go through, you will watch out the pattern that you saw over here. So if you look for them and, and determine which slit it went through, then you wouldn't see any interference pattern and they will look exactly like marbles going through two slits. However, if you start watching them, then you will be, again reproduce this interference pattern. So that's a very remarkable experiment, which people have thought about for over a century. And there's no, there's no alternative to the conclusion from experiments like this and others, that really if I ask which slit does an electron go through when I'm not looking, the only possible answer is that it really went through both. And it's in some quantum state, it's in a state as it's going through, which is a superposition of both going to the left and the right. So that's a very new concept that we don't have any analog in classical physics, or Newtonian physics. The concept of this non-local nature of the state of an electron, uh, which, also, which involves two different configurations that in fact need not even be spatially uh, uh, that close to each other. So there's one configuration of an electron which I'll denote by, by this symbol L. This is some state, abstract state of the electron going through the left, left slit and then another state of the electron going to the right slit. And the correct statement is that when, an, quantum mechanically, when an electron goes through the screen, uh, it goes through a, a state which is the sum of the two. So this is, you know, this is a sim very simple looking equation, but uh, really very deep and, uh, and, uh, and remarkable in its consequences. It's just, it's saying that there are these two spatially separate states which really characterize uh, the electron at the same time. And so the information about the state of the electron is, is really quite non-local. Uh, it's both here and there. So, you know, I, and you should really resist accepting this, and many people did, including Einstein, had real difficulty with these ideas, but experiments in the last century have really convincingly demonstrated that this is indeed correct. Uh, this being, of course, the simplest one. All right, so that, uh, now that I've introduced the radical concept of superposition, let me now go one step further and talk about entanglement. Basically, entanglement is, based, is just superposition, but when you're talking about more than one electron. So let's take a, a simple system like a hydrogen atom. So that has a nucleus, uh, as I'm sure most of all of you know, and an electron outside it. Now, the only thing I need to know about the electron uh, is the, the, the fact that the electron uh, is spinning on its axis. And in, in fact, there's only two possible directions of spin. It can either spin clockwise or anticlockwise. I represent that spin by arrow pointing up or down. So imagine this is a state of a hydrogen atom with the electron spinning on its axis in a clockwise direction. All right, so that's what a well, hydrogen atom on its own looks like. But now let me take a hydrogen molecule. So there I have two hydrogen atoms. These are two, two, two protons with two electrons. And now I ask the question, what are, what are the spins of the electron? So if you go in and look, the spins are again in a superposition state. It's now not a superposition of one electron being left or right. It's now a superposition of the spins of the electron. So there's one state in which one electron is up and the other electron is down. And then there's another state where the situation is reversed, where this left electron is down, the right electron is up. And so now I, I just, in fact, in this case, you have to subtract them for technical reasons that won't be important. Uh, but now you have a superposition of two distinct states. And when you have this with two electrons, that's called entanglement because the state of one electron is now entangled and correlated in some very interesting way with the state of the other electron. Uh, and and this, this is really what happens in a single hydrogen atom. Okay, so this you could sort of accept as something happening inside a, a little atom that there's some non-locality within the atom. Uh, but what's a remarkable fact about this, this, this and this non-locality or the superposition is what's called quantum entanglement. Now the remarkable fact is that this, uh, while it may be local, uh, it can have very striking consequences over long scales. And this was first pointed out by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, where they imagined the following thought experiment. So, so here's my hydrogen molecule with the electrons in this entangled state. Now imagine we can do an experiment where I pull the two atoms apart very far away, one to opposite ends of the room, but I do it slowly enough 
but I don't perturb the spins of the electron. Then what will happen if I do this, then uh, when I move the electron, when we move the atoms apart, the spins are not disturbed. So really, this, if this electron, this atom that I moved over here had an up electron, then the other atom has to have a down electron because that's exactly how this particular state was constructed. But if I move the other part in the superposition, then I have the opposite state, where then this is down and that is up. So now if I come in and look at the spin of the electron, you have this remarkable prediction that if you measure this electron being down, then the other electron, which, may have, which could be extremely far away, is instantaneously known to be in the up state. So again, there's a non-locality now which can extend you know, really across, uh, you know, across the Earth or even up to the, uh, to the planets if you separated the hydrogen molecule carefully enough between a measurement and an observation of an electron over here and one infinitely far away, possibly infinitely far away. And this is all tied to the fact that way in the past, they were near each other and their states were entangled. And that entanglement of the quantum state, that non-local nature is preserved uh, over even when you separate them really far. So this is what's sometimes called the EPR paradox, uh, that observations very far away are strongly correlated. Uh, and the only possible, I mean, in fact, this does work. The experiments which are analogs of this have been done, and it does absolutely work. And the only possible conclusion is, again, as I said earlier, the idea of the state of a system is a very non-local idea. Uh, and it really involves superposition between electrons in many different configurations. And once you understand the possibility of that, and, and try to apply this idea to, to electrons and crystals, uh, as I'm going to discuss in the remaining time, you will then uh, also you will see, for example, a distinction between a superconductor and a metal and an insulator. Okay, so, the, so that was a lightning introduction to quantum superposition and entanglement. Uh, uh, and now I'm going to tie these simple ideas uh, to, well, they're not so simple, these simply explained ideas, I hope, uh, to, to the other topics I've introduced. So let's just try to connect this now first to ideas on quantum criticality. And this is a topic I haven't discussed so far. It will become clear why I need this when I finally talk about experiments and the connection to, to black holes in the last part of my talk. So here, let me take a specific material. Uh, this is thallium copper chloride. It has a rather complicated crystal structure. Uh, and it really is none of that is really important for us. What's important is that each copper atom is very much like a hydrogen atom. It has one electron whose spin we want to track. And in fact, if you take a crystal of thallium copper chloride, what you find is that the electrons are in fact exactly in this EPR pair. This electron is entangled with that one in this configuration. When one is up, the other is down, or vice versa. Uh, and this is this so this material has the spins basically tied to each other, and, uh, and one consequence of this is that when you put a magnetic field, uh, this system doesn't respond at all. And so you can tell from those experiments what the electrons are doing. Now, if you take this material and apply pressure on it, through reasons I won't go into, but what you observe experimentally uh, is that this entanglement disappears at some point. And then you get a state in which the electrons are either definitely up or definitely down. That is, they decide what well, this electron decides to be up and everybody else falls into place. And so now you're in a state where there's no entanglement. So in this crystal, which has just been studied over the, you know, relatively recently, just by doing something as simple as applying pressure, you can turn, uh, you can go from a state with nearest neighbor entanglement of the electrons to no entanglement in, in this. And this state has this checkerboard pattern of half electrons up and half down, and sometimes called antiferromagnetism. Uh, so that's just a buzzword I'll use. If you see this word, this just means that the spins are in this, uh, this, this kind of pattern where half of them up and other half are down. Okay, so this means that, you, so here's another picture of this transformation and entanglement of the electrons. If I apply pressure to thallium copper chloride, then at atmospheric pressure, these spins are entangled in nearest neighbor pairs. And at high pressure, they disentangle into this antiferromagnet. Okay, so, so, so now we have these two well understood states with relatively simple types of entanglement or no entanglement, and simple descriptions of what the electrons are doing in these materials, uh, what the spins of the electrons are doing, anyway. 
But what I want to focus on is this very special point in between, uh, sometimes called the quantum critical point, where this transformation happens, where you go from this state to that state. And it turns out these, these states of matter, right at this very special critical point, are some of the most interesting quantum states of matter because they have entanglement, which is again long range. So here it's only nearest neighbors, but here on their own, just by applying pressure at this special point, uh, what we have understood is that if you look at the uh, wave front, the, the state of the quantum state of the electrons, uh, it's got spins entangled with each other over, over very long scales. So the quantum critical point then is a special point between the phases where quantum entanglement becomes long range, not by some clever experiment that of very carefully separating two electrons as EPR did, but just simply taking this crystal and uh, tuning it to the critical pressure. Uh, and you can then do experiments to test the nature of this entanglement. So in this state then, this spin of this electron could be entangled with a spin over there, and, and you get this entanglement over all scales really, and you get some very complicated quantum state, this quantum critical point, uh, that many of us are working hard to understand better and related to various experiments on this material. So again, so this event, that's the state over here. So now we ask, so here's the ideal state of what this crystal would look like at, low temp at very low temperatures. But you come out and now shake it a little bit and heat it up a bit, and you ask, how are the electrons going to respond to a little bit of uh, temperature? So at this point, you draw this phase diagram that uh, we've seen in our conference quite a bit, and I'll just try to give you the basic idea of what's going on here. So you have these two phases, this antiferromagnet uh, and these entangled spin pair state. And when you raise it to temperature, there's a certain blue regimes where you just uh, slowly deform that state. So here the spins you know, rotate a little bit. Over here, some of these anti-parallel spins in, the, in, in this entangled state get disentangled. Uh, and there's a way of describing all these, these simple states rather in an effective classical picture uh, of how you uh, perturb these local quantum degrees of freedom. Uh, but the region I want to focus on, as it become clear for in the remaining part of my talk, is this intermediate regime called the quantum critical regime, where really to understand what's going on, you really have to think about quantum entanglement at all length scales and how things evolve in time when you have entangled electrons uh, interacting with each other. Uh, and so that's really a, a frontier field which many of us are really trying to think about and also test in various experiments. All right, so that's then, you now know, know, know what this buzzword quantum criticality means. It's, it's a way of getting complex quantum entanglement uh, in, 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 a, in a material with electrons uh, like thallium copper chloride. All right, so now let me introduce the other piece of the puzzle, which is superconductivity. So what is superconductivity due to? What causes uh, YBCO to have this ability to transmit electricity over miles without any degradation? Uh, in the voltage. Well, the basic idea of between superconductivity is the idea of Bose condensation. So this is uh, Professor Bose, who was a scientist in Calcutta, in the, I guess in the 30s, who came up with the idea of, of the condens condensation uh, as, a quantum, as a quantum consequence of the effect on particles, which are now known as bosons in his honor. So I'm going to illustrate this by this beautiful experiment uh, by, by these, these researchers here. What they did is they took a bunch of rubidium atom, so each red circle here is a rubidium atom, so sort of like a billiard ball, if you wish, and it's moving in this egg carton, uh, which is really uh, created by standing wave of laser light. And so what you see is that there are these minima in the potential felt uh, by the rubidium atoms, and they like to sit in the minima. But also, these atoms being quantum particles have the ability to tunnel or uh, with or quantum mechanically go from one minima to the other. And in fact, so that as a result of being a superposition state between being here and say being there, just like the electron at the beginning of my talk could go to the left slit or the right slit. So what, what uh, these researchers did was study the configuration of these atoms as you change the intensity of the laser light, which you can think of a way of, of, of changing the, the, the depth of the egg card. And what they found was that when this, when this potential was not too, too steep and, and there was lots of superposition of atoms between neighboring sites, uh, you got a superfluid state. Uh, and this is due to the formation of a Bose or a Bose-Einstein condensate. And what this means is that if you took this, this system and you tilted it a little bit, 
Uh, all the atoms will flow without any resistance at all. Uh, and this is analogous to the ability of electrons and YBCO to flow without any resistance and transmit electricity over long, long distances. So what is the state that allows this liquid of atoms to flow without any resistance, sometimes called a superfluid or a superconductor? Uh, well, in a word, it's just this very simple state. It's again a superposition. So I began my talk by talking about the electron being a superposition of left and right. Well, here we have a very large number of atoms, and it's really a superposition of all atoms in all positions. Really, that's all there is to it. And let me just show you in a few pictures. So let me take a simple picture with three possible positions of the atoms, and, and, and let me put one atom in it. So the, this one atom could be here, but it could be here or here. And it prefers, in fact, to be in all three places at the same time. So it forms a superposition that I'll call G. So this blue atom is in the state G, but it's either here or there or there. And it's really in all three places, uh, just like the electron was either left or right. So that's one atom. Now let me do this for a second atom uh, and a third atom. So I have now three atoms who are all in all three places at the same time, the blue, the green, and the red atom. And this is what their states look like. So now each one of these uh, Gs is the superposition of, you know, this, the, the blue G is the blue atom in three places. Uh, the, the red G is, a, is the red atom in three places. And similarly for the green G, if I expand this out, I have three times three times three, 27 terms. And this is what the terms look like. There's one in which, you know, they the have blue, green, red. There's a term over here where all three are on the right, or a term here where all three are on the left, and so on. And this set of 23 terms is the analog of the superfluid state uh, of these atoms. So it's, it's, super, it's basically superposition maxed out at to, to the pos maximum possible extent. We have the atoms being entirely non-local. All the atoms are delocalized. Uh, and, and it's this, the fact that the atoms are everywhere at the same time, really that's really what's happening, uh, it, what causes superfluidity uh, in this material. So here's another picture of it. If you were to take a snapshot of a, a picture of these atoms while they're in the superfluid state, you will get any one of these configurations with essentially equal probability. Uh, and it's really in all of those 27 configurations for these three atoms. So that's, in, in very simple terms, once you understand superposition, you also understand the idea of superfluidity of bosons. Uh, and that's really what's happening here. So here's a snapshot of my superfluid. It really is one term in a very large superposition of different states of the atom uh, that allows them to then flow without resistance. Okay. Uh, so this is just a caveat for the experts, and I won't say more about that. So, what the, so that's a superfluid. What about a superconductor? in a material like YBCO. Well, a superconductor is something very analogous, where each G now is this single pair that I talked about before. So I talked about these two electrons forming uh, this entangled state, sorry, up, down, minus, uh, down, up. So you take a, the electrons tend to pair up in a, in a superconductor, uh, and these pair of electrons then behaves like one of these rubidium atoms, and then you get a condensate of these pairs of electrons in these entangled states. So, so in the end, uh, a superconductor uh, is, is really a, has a combination of all the physics I've introduced so far. There's local entanglement of the spins, and then there's this complicated entanglement in, this, in the center of mass of these pairs of spins uh, that leads eventually to the superconducting state. So then in the last you know, in 40 minutes, I've given you a basis of the theory of superconductivity. So here's then a, a more careful look at this high temperature superconductor, this YBCO material. These are cousins of them. Uh, these electrons that form this state uh, sit on the copper atoms here, which form a square lattice. Uh, and, and for reasons that we are beginning to understand, they, they do this very readily and at rather high temperatures. That's why they're called the high temperature superconductors. Now these were discovered in 1987, this family of superconductors. Just uh, two years ago, there's a new family discovered, the so-called iron pinnictides. Uh, they have a somewhat more complicated crystal structure, uh, but they have the same common feature of having uh, this transition metal like iron in this case, which is sitting on a, on a square lattice. Um, so these are, this is then another superconductor, and now let me show you, this is the most complex thing I'm going to show in this talk, an actual experimental phase diagram. So what are the axes here? The horizontal axis is the density of electrons that are moving in the, among the ion atoms here. 
that you can control by carefully varying the doping, by carefully varying the concentration of the arson, oh no, the, the lanthanum and the oxygen, I believe. Uh, so you control the electron density by some clever chemical means, and here's temperature. And then there's a window here where the systems form a superconductor uh, up to rather high temperatures uh, for around 50 Kelvin. Uh, and this is the, the state where you have this Bose condensate in of pairs of electrons. You also see this regime here where you get antiferromagnetism, much like in thallium copper chloride under pressure, the electrons, rather than being, being entangled in pairs, uh, have a definite spin polarization. And finally, I want to focus on this red region here. Uh, this is in some sense the most least well understood and the most interesting region. Uh, it's sometimes called for once of a, oops, and uh, I got that out of order. So the, what I want to, first part I want to make is make an analogy between this shape of this region uh, and this antiferromagnetism disappearing here uh, and this kind of phase diagram I showed you for thallium copper chloride. So this red region looks rather like this quantum critical region uh, where I emphasize the long range nature of entanglement. Uh, so highly non-trivial nature of entanglement, very different from either in this state or in the superconductor. Uh, and so this region in between is sometimes called a strange metal for want of a better word. And it's also looking, uh, to best we understand today, where you again have this non-local non entanglement uh, controlling the dynamics of these electrons. And one of its features, which is being measured here as a resistivity, has a certain dependence on temperature that's not particularly important for the rest of my talk. Anyway, so the challenge now for many of us working in this area is to first of all understand what causes the high temperature superconductivity, uh, uh, and, and then how, why, is it connect, why is it often found near magnetism, and finally, what is the strange metal, and can you really understand uh, the physics of entanglement in this rather strange metallic state? Uh, that's really the heart of the problem. We all, many of us believe that once you get this straightened out, you'll have a much better understanding of these complex phenomena in, in these materials. Okay, so that's the end of a lightning discussion of superconductivity. Again, showing you uh, how quantum entanglement appears uh, in, in an even more richer variety of states here, which involve not just uh, spins being entangled, but also the positions of pairs of spins um, in this complicated both condensate state. So now to make things even more complex, I'm going to change gears completely and then talk about things that I know, knew almost nothing about a few years ago. Uh, but this is, of course, uh, related to work by Chandrasekhar, which seemingly seems completely unrelated. But as you'll see, ideas on quantum entanglement have, have recently turned out really crucial to understanding the physics of black holes. And those ideas have a really exciting interplay with some of these other ideas we've introduced in the context of quantum criticality and in superconductivity. All right, so what's a black hole? So I presume most of you know what a black hole is. It's a, it's a very dense object uh, with lots and lots of matter in it. Uh, so that if, if, you try, if light tried to escape, well, the light carrying energy uh, is also gravitationally attracted back to the whole black hole by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, and so if the, if, the, if, the, if the star is so massive that light can't, even light can't get out, uh, well then that's called a black hole. So this is one of the remarkable consequences of Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, which also then showed the existence of what's called the black hole horizon, uh, which is this shell at the surface of the black hole uh, we, of radius which is related to the neutron's gravitational constant, the velocity of light, and, and the mass of the star. So in fact, now, you know, these were just theoretical ideas uh, at, at, at the time of uh, the discovery of Einstein general relativity, but today we have many reliable examples of black holes in, uh, in the universe. In fact, there's probably a black hole at the center of our own galaxy, which is the, as a mass of several million solar masses. Uh, and so they, they really seem to be everywhere and really crucial in understanding these astro, uh, phenomena in astrophysics. But here I want to think about you know, what for astrophysical black holes are, are very small effects, the effects of quantum mechanics uh, right, near the, right near the horizon of a black hole. Uh, oh, I guess one thing I should say. So uh, the, the, the theory of black holes got a, you know, of course a, a basic start by fundamental work of Chandrasekhar for which he won the Nobel Prize they argued that above a certain mass called the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, stars were unstable and some of them could collapse to black holes. Uh, that was understood a bit later. And then he went on to also develop uh, 
a very detailed theory of the dynamics of, of black holes. Okay, so here I want to turn instead to jump ahead to 1974, where this purely theoretically, Bekenstein and Hawking thinking of, started thinking about the effects of quantum mechanics, ideas of quantum superposition and entanglement on, on what have on the other horizon of a black hole. And this led to you know, very remarkable uh, conclusions. So, and, and the basic idea is now let's go back to the same EPR experiment I began my talk with, where you have an entanglement between the spin of two electrons, one up and the other down in the hydrogen molecules. And let's just imagine that this hydrogen molecule uh, finds itself to be unlucky enough to be on either side of the horizon of a black hole. So just say, just imagine that this horizon, one atom is on one side, the other atom is on the other side. It's possible. Well then, because of the gravitational forces, one atom will pull inside, and the other one, well, perhaps you're pulling it away somehow, it's able to escape. So it's, it's possible to have a process where, just quantum mechanically, you can have an entanglement between, a, so this, the spin of this electron then is entangled with the spin of that electron, and so, although no information can pass across, the, no information can go from the inside to the outside, if I measure the spin of this electron to be up or down, in principle, I know what the spin of the other electron is doing. So, the, so a quantum state can be you know, not only entangled across a double slit or over many sites in a crystal like YBCO, it can also be entangled on both sides of the horizon of a black hole, one atom outside and one, one atom out inside. And string theory has played a really uh, uh, remarkable role in giving us a clearer picture of, of the nature of this entanglement in, in, in certain types of black holes. Okay, so I guess I've already mentioned that. Uh, the, the, the spins of the electrons up or down can be non-locally entangled across the horizon of a black hole. Okay, so this entanglement, as we understand today, turns out to lead to a temperature called the Hawking temperature. So the horizon is actually uh, has a certain temperature, it's always radiating particles, and there's a certain entropy associated with the horizon, and that's uh, basically uh, linked to the fact uh, that we know once, you know, these, even though these states are, quantum, are, are entangled with each other, we have no way of accessing what happened to the atom that, on the other side of the horizon. Uh, and so there's an, uh, and that leads to an uncertainty in our knowledge of, of, of the state of this electron out here, and that eventually leads to entropy and temperature of the black hole, uh, called so-called Hawking temperature and the Bekenstein entropy. All right, so then that's a lightning introduction then to black hole and string theory, and I've shown you how quantum supervision and entanglement is also a key feature in understanding this remarkable new f physics of the interplay between quantum mechanics and black holes. And of course, it was crucial in superconductivity. So let me, uh, I guess the last 10 minutes or so, wrap up my talk by closing the last leg of the triangle. So, which is of course, you know, what we want to do. Can something we know about black holes teach us something about superconductivity? Okay, so he, here I want to consider the following Gedanken experiment. So this is, I hasten to add, there is no black hole out there which looks anything like this. Uh, but imagine that you have a black hole and you're able to add charges to the black hole. Uh, which, which all have the same charge, so just all electrons with negatively charged, no protons, and they keep falling into the black hole because they're pulled by the, uh, by the gravitational force. But after a while, if you put enough charges in the black hole, uh, then the subsequent electrons will not only feel the attraction due to gravity, they'll also feel the coulomb repulsion, the repulsion from all the other electrons, from the electrical forces. So at least in principle, it's possible to imagine a state in which there's an exact balance between these two states, where the gravitation and electrical forces balance, and you get a, a new possible state of a black hole, uh, where you know the, the, it's this completely stable, nothing's falling in, not, not out. There's a there's a bunch of charges around the black hole. There's a net charge, and and right on, on this region here, there's an exact balance between the electrical and gravitational forces. So this is a state that's been considered in, in, in string theory in the last few years. And it turns out this state is also a superconductor, uh, at least in many, many common configurations. Uh, so, so now we have the final uh, link in the puzzle. Black holes can also become superconductors. Uh, and that's realized one of the quantum phases of matter in, in, in this sort of very strange looking configuration. Uh, it turns out that through string theory, and this is of course something I haven't explained, 
uh, there is a, a very deep correspondence between many quantum states of matter of the type that I've discussed, like superconductors and metals, and we hope strange metals, uh, to various possible states of black holes with matter on them. And, 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 so, and, this, and these very different configurations have a mapping that has given a much deeper understanding, uh, not only of the, of the uh, physics of quantum mechanics near black holes, but also of the quantum phases of electrons, which is really my personal interest in thinking about quantum mechanics uh, and, and, and uh, understanding high temperature superconductivity. Okay, so the, and, the, and the common thread tying together uh, superconducting black holes, quantum criticality, and, uh, and these uh, superconducting states, the idea of quantum entanglement, and especially the, special, the critical points where the entanglement becomes uh, long range. And really what the fundamental property of a black hole that makes it so useful, uh, at least theoretically, is also a very natural state, as I discussed, where you get long range entanglement. Okay, so the main question now, which is really in a sense open, but, also, but keeping us, many of us excited and thinking about things much more, is can this connection between long range entanglement near, uh, near a black hole and long range entanglement near a quantum critical point of the type found in thallium copper chloride or in uh, one of these iron nictite superconductors, can that lead to a deeper understanding of the two fields and eventually to a better understanding of, uh, of high temperature superconductors like YBCO? I think the, the answer is still open, but it's definitely true that we've got a new window into thinking about uh, the strange consequence of quantum mechanics uh, in, in an entirely new regime where you've gone from just the superposition and a double slit to entanglement over you know, macroscopic scales involving millions and millions of electrons together. So I think I'll hand over there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you see that the concept of law, say for a triplex state, or you can take a pi naught particle. Yeah. And you know, one particle and the other one, they have to conserve angular momentum. So, sure. you want to call it a superposition and not just conservation? Well, I'm not comfortable with that idea. Uh, because it involves, you know, uh, or the correlation across. Of, across astrophysical But it's distance. also true that yeah. when the object fell apart, yeah. there's a perfectly causal relationship between how one went away and the other went away. Well, at okay. a much so, later point, it's not. But so well, much. okay. So uh, it is true that for just this one simple experiment, it's possible to define the so-called hidden variable theories and 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 sidestep the idea of entanglement and really think about it as you know correlations between two different configurations which you're just measuring probabilistically, you know. But there are more complicated measurements. So for example, you can imagine doing a measurement not just along the up-down axis, but on the left-right axis and other angles. And if you look at the whole set of them, then you're forced to this idea that there is really a non-local superposition. That's related to the so-called Bell's inequality that I didn't discuss. But you're right, in the experiment that I just described, the simple one, there are other ways of in principle understanding it, but we know that those don't work. Uh, Just one more question. Sure. I, I thought <laughs> one way to look there. at this whole thing yeah. is also to look at the permutation symmetry of your entire ensemble. You know, yeah. in the superconductor, there's just one state, so it's completely correlated, long range yes. correlation. Yes. Same with the antiferromagnet. I, would, I, I was just dis mostly but, 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 but with the other so called entangled state, there doesn't seem to be that kind of long range correlation, right? Uh, and, and the permutation symmetry of that state will be different. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I understand your question, but uh, let me just go back to this picture. Uh, so, well, I mean, yeah, let's look at this picture. So here, I, 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 first I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that these are, that the, the superfluid state is in many different configurations. It's really, there's only one state, and that one state is the sum of these configurations. So it's, there is just a unique state uh, which describes this superfluid, 
And in that, when you measure this, the position of the atoms in that superfluid, you are equally likely to get any one of these configurations. Uh, and really, it's correct to say that before measurement, it's really in all states at the same time. There's, that's the strange thing about quantum mechanics, and Bell's inequality also establishes similar uh, conclusions. <laughs> Uh, and so in, when I talked about this entanglement here, where did it go? Yeah, this picture. Well, here, you know, I, I imagine this being being entangled with this one, this one over this one, and this is just one term in many, many terms of the actual state of the system. Uh, so we don't know, unlike this Bose condensate, I can't, it is not a simple term, simple series. It's a rather complicated series, and this connection to black hole physics is giving us a new way of talking about uh, this complicated series of superpositions. You described uh, a black oh, hole. Where was the question? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. An extremal black hole as a superconductor. Yes. Does it work in the sense of its being perfectly diamagnetic? Uh, I believe so, yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll expel magnetic flux. I mean, that, that was, I should emphasize, more in the realm of a Gedanken experiment, which is teaching us more about the quantum states of matter rather than actual black holes. And there's, no, there's no possibility astrophysically that you could ever get that much charge into a black hole to make that happen. The Coulomb forces are much too strong. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, quantum mechanics goes back a long ways now and there are things that you're not supposed to understand. They're just not <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> actually done it. Um, well, I, I don't know. It depends what you mean by understand. I think we have a complete theory which we, in principle, know how to calculate any you considerable calculate, measurement. You can calculate a lot, but you don't necessarily know what's actually happening. Well, I think, you know, that's a philosophical question. I think if you can calculate, you understand. Well, okay. <laughs> in my opinion. Then, then, then the question comes up is that basically this is a wave theory. Uh, okay. What's waving? <laughs> well, I, I didn't mention waves anyway, did I? <laughs> so the, the wave theory is one formulation of the way you can formulate quantum mechanics. But I try to abstract it. Uh, just forget about waves. Just think in terms of discrete states, discrete state of an electron going to the left or the right, or these atoms, uh, you know, these atoms being in these discrete positions, here or there or there. Where is the wave? Uh, these are atoms, they are, they are real atoms in three places at the same time, and it's in a superposition. So the real revolutionary concept is, is the idea of a superposition. Uh, the wave theory is just one way of formulating it. I think this is a deeper way of thinking about it. But does the calculation not use something that's equivalent to a wave theory? That's the, again, that's a calculation tool. Conceptually, this is, I think, the cleanest way to think about it, because it brings in you know, this idea of superposition and entanglement that seems to generalize across many different fields in a, in a very compact way. So, okay. <laughs> so I've given you a particular perspective, but the wave particle duality that I'm sure you've heard of can be derived as a consequence of the things I talked about. Uh, maybe there are some questions from the school students here? No? I guess they've understood everything. There's one still. Okay, great. <laughs> I still have the same uniform that I used to wear. <laughs> well, with regard to uh, uh, the quantum entanglement, actually, at the quantum critical point, uh, I was wondering whether it's actually bound by Pauli's exclu uh, exclusion, pr uh, exclusion pr principle or not. So whether uh, one electro uh, electron is entangled only with uh, one more electron or with the whole group of electrons, actually. Uh, that's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Great question. So let me just throw this picture. So there's many levels of entanglement here. So there's like two levels of entanglement in this quantum critical state. So here I'm showing you a snapshot uh, of the electrons. And in this snapshot, this electron is entangled with that one, and this one with that one. And at least for spin, I, these electrons with only two possible spins, that's, they have to be entangled pairwise. However, this is just one term over many, many terms. I've just written one snapshot. There are other terms, but this is entangled with this one, and this one, and that one, and so on. So you just pair them up any way you want. They take a superposition of all of that. So there's not only entanglement of these 
these valence bonds, that we call these ellipses a valence bond, uh, these are basically covalent bonds of chemistry, there's not only entanglement within a covalent bond, but entanglement of the covalent bonds themselves. So, uh, so once you account for both levels of entanglement, then each electron eventually gets entangled almost with every other electron in, in the final state. <laughs> So you can see entanglement is a very useful word. You can explain almost anything. <laughs> God bless. Thanks to you again. Yeah, thank you.